Hi, welcome to this talk, The Right Foot in the Wrong Place. I'm Joe Vanden Heuvel. I'm a developer at Valve Software. And on behalf of my collaborators, James Cunliffe and Eddie Parker, I'll be presenting our work on the character locomotion system developed for the VR exclusive game, Half-Life Alex. Developing this locomotion system for a VR game presented some unique challenges. The virtual environments were tight and dense by design, so there was no room for our characters to deviate from the navigate navigation paths that were calculated by the AI. Our solution needed to support a variety of human and non-human characters, including supporting different numbers of legs for each of them. Um, our team was relatively small by AAA game standards, so our solution couldn't rely on having tons and tons of animation data. Um, and our game had to run at over 90 frames per second, so our solution had to be very fast. The solution we came up with consisted of three systems working together in unison. There is a stride retargeting system, a footstep prediction system, and an animation selection system. So let's start with the stride retargeting system. Our stride retarding system was based in large part on the work of Rune Johansson in his 2009 thesis paper. The core concept of that paper was to establish this concept of a foot base. You can think of a foot base as like the, the boards of an elliptical machine. They move along with the feet. They're always in contact with the feet, but they remain mostly parallel to the ground. As an offline process, we'd calculate the position of the foot base for each frame of the animation. Then we would project that position onto the vector from the previous step position to the next step position. We'd calculate the offset from that projected position to the foot base and convert the offset to a stride relative coordinate system and save it out. At runtime, we could then recreate the location of the foot base based on new previous and next footstep positions and use the resulting calculated foot base position as the IK target to move the leg to. We did a very similar thing for the rotation of the feet. We would establish at the beginning of the footstep and at the end of the footstep, what the orientation of the foot was and use a lerp between those two as kind of the base rotation. And then each frame establish, okay, what is the delta from that base interpolation, what it would be at that time, and save that out. And we would use that at runtime to recreate the motion of the animation exactly. The nice thing about this data was that um, if the footsteps were in exactly the same position as they were in the original animation, then there would be no visible change. The only time a change would show up is if you go and change where the footstep positions are and then the foot would go directly to the target location while preserving the original timing and style of the source animation. Once you had this data, you could start playing around with it and doing some fun stuff with it. Uh, for example, you could go and reduce the stride length of the animation simply by going and making the previous and next footsteps closer together. You could adjust the height of the footsteps. This was especially useful if you were going and reducing the stride length You'd also want the height of the footstep to adjust, adjust proportionally to have the steps look a lot more natural at the different length. Um, but really, you could go and change the footsteps to be kind of anywhere. Um, this allowed us to go and completely change how and where the characters were moving as they were navigating the world. It allowed us to naturally handle things like slopes, uneven terrain, and following complicated tight navigation paths. So once we had this system in place where we could go and move the feet where we needed to, we needed to figure out, well, where do we want to move them to? To do that, we first had to realize that to find out where the foot is going to be, what we really need to know is where the character is going to be, because the foot motion data gives us an offset for the player of when the foot is going to land. So using the foot motion data, we can go and look up what is the time in the animation where the foot will next be on the ground. And then we can go and look up how much will the character move between now and that point in time and use that root motion change to go and establish, okay, this is how far the character is going to move between now and when the foot next lands on the ground. We'd use this data with navigation paths 
by going and walking that same distance along the path to go and find the location of where the target is going to be. Once the target was at that location, we needed to figure out how much will the character have rotated in that time. We found that it was easiest to do this by kind of breaking the movement of the character into two modes. The first mode was the target look mode. In this mode, which was used for, for example, for the soldiers when they're strafing, because they would need to maintain aim on the player character. So we would know that by the time they had reached a future point along the path, they should still be looking at some target in the world. And therefore, we'd be able to use that information to understand what orientation the character should be at that future time. Similarly, um, if the characters weren't strafing, they tended to be facing the direction that they were moving, which would mean that the correct position for them to be facing would be towards the next waypoint along the path. Once we'd established the position and orientation of the character in the future, we could use the foot motion data to go and find the offset from the character to where the foot will be at that point in the animation. And there we would have our next footstep landing position, and that would be the basis from which we could reconstruct the trajectory of the foot as it went from previous step to next step. So things got a little more complicated once we started trying to do this while blending from one animation to another. The problem was that the, the root motion of the animations, it wasn't linear. We had things like zombies that would have kind of a, a lurching motion as they were navigating. So we couldn't just use a simple blend over time and interpolation to go and accurately figure out where the foot was going to be. So instead what we did was we looked at what was the velocity of the source animation and the target animation at the time the transition happened. We'd go and save that difference in velocity. And from that point on, we would add that velocity as an additional offset on just the target animation and reduce that over time so that eventually the movement speed was purely based on the new animation. Once we'd established this, it was relatively simple to go and figure out an equation that would let us know how much total distance that additional fading velocity would add to the distance that the character traveled over time. And so we could still calculate what the accurate foot position would be in the future. Uh, the final piece of the puzzle was selecting the animations that would be used uh, as the characters were navigating through the world. So stride retargeting could change the animations to move the feet along the path however we wanted them to do, modifying the original animation. But going and having animations that were moving in one direction and, having, and retargeting the feet so that they were walking in the complete opposite direction would yield really unpleasant results. Um, you would lose all of the benefits of any kind of motion to the body and inertia, momentum, leaning into turns uh, that you would have gotten. So the best results came when the animation that we were playing didn't differ too much from how the strider targeting system was adjusting the feet. So we needed a system that was really good at picking the closest animation based on a set of criteria. That system's basically motion matching. Uh, just a refresher on motion matching, there's a lot of literature out there, but just a quick refresher. Um, the core idea is that you establish a set of metrics. These are things that you are going and measuring um, about your animation data. They kind of break down into two categories. There's pose metrics, which are metrics that are about the current state of the character, and goal metrics, which are metrics about a desired future state. Um, for example, a pose metric might be what is the current velocity of the character, and a goal metric might be what is the desired future velocity of the character. You then, as an offline process, go and sample all of the animations in your data set and calculate values for each of these metrics. Then at runtime, you would calculate a goal state, a goal value for each of these metrics. So what is the value, what is the speed that my character is currently at? And what is the speed that I want them to go at? You then go through each sample that you would calculate it offline and calculate a score for it based on how different that sample is from the goal that you want your character to end up at. In the end, the sample with the closest score becomes the current value. 
Next frame, you do it again, but also calculate a new score for the current state. And if any of the animation samples had a better score than the current state, then that sample would become the new current state. And that's motion matching in a nutshell. Living with motion matching, it sounds idyllic. Hey, it's going to take care of all this stuff for you. But in the end, it ends up feeling a bit like parenting because what you're doing is you're making the system that's going to go off in the world and make decisions for itself about what it should do. So you're constantly trying to teach it, make good decisions, but also just as important, you have to teach it not to make bad decisions. So teaching it not to make bad decisions uh, mostly comes down to limiting the options available for it to choose. We did this in a couple of ways. The first way was breaking down the data set into groups that could be added and removed from the search on the fly at runtime based on game logic. An example of this was we had all of the animations for facing down the path in its own clip group. And when we wanted our character to strafe, we wouldn't include any of those non-strafing animations in the set of data that the motion matching could search. Another way we did this was with the use of filters. Uh, filters are a minimum and maximum value associated with each metric. And when it, the search, the animations, the search is going through the animation data, it would go and check and see, okay, is the value of this sample outside of the range for this particular metric? And if it fails on that for any metric, the entire sample is discarded. You can't, it, can, it can't pick that one. So here's an example of where we used filters. One of the problems that we ran into was if the character needed to traverse a really short distance, the motion matching system would sometimes pick animation clips that were after the feet had stopped moving. There was just a little bit of settling, as you can see in this video, a um, little bit of settling left the feet, but the feet had already come to a stop. We didn't want it to go and start that animation at that point. So what we did was we added a metric that went and measured the number of steps that were remaining uh, in each animation from that point to the end of the animation. And then we would use a filter to go and say, when you're searching through the available set of options, don't pick any animations that don't have any more footsteps. And that was allowed us to kind of get around this problem. The other example that we have is distance remaining. Um, it was very important that our characters stopped exactly at the end of their navigation paths. With our, uh, with our environment so dense for a virtual reality game, what would happen is the characters, if they overshot or undershot the end of the path that was calculated by the AI, they could potentially be obscuring their line of sight to the player. And that would mean that they'd need to come to a stop and then start moving again to try and establish a shot on the character, so, um, which could totally break gameplay if they just kept going back and forth and never actually getting to the spot where they could shoot at the player. So what we did was we added another metric that was how much distance is remaining before to traverse before you get to the end of the animation. Um, and when we were within a certain distance of the goal, we'd enable this filter to say, look, if this, if this clip isn't gonna get us to the uh, far enough to reach the end of the path, then just don't pick it. Um, so we would always pick clips that, were, that would take us at least as far, if not beyond the end of the path. And then we would use the stride retargeting system to reduce the length of the strides so that in the end, the character would come to a stop exactly at the right point. So making good choices for the motion matching system mostly meant improving the scores that were, uh, that were good. If, you, if an animation was supposed to be picked because it really is the right one for the situation, making sure that the motion matching system gave it a good score. Um, a prime example of this was going and picking path samples. In the original literature for motion matching, um, when going and specifying matching a, a, a shape to a path that you wanted the character to run, they would say, go and calculate where will this animation take me in a quarter of a second, in a half a second, a full second from now. Um, and in order to go and use that with the goal metric to go and say, well, what, where do I want them to be? this amount of time from now, you have to assume, well, how fast are you going to be traveling? 
And so you'll have to go and make some assumptions about what the rate of acceleration is of the character in order to find out how far along the path that sample should be. Um, the problem is that our data set didn't have one acceleration rate that worked correctly for all of the available samples. This was especially too, true when we had changes of direction coming into corners where the character would slow down and then speed up again. And even in our stand to run animations, the rate of acceleration changed as they were going from a stand to a run. So what we did was we switched from a time based sampling, which was tell me where the character is going to be after one second to distance based sampling of the path, which is saying, where is this animation going to be after it has moved the character five feet after it's moved the character 10 feet. And when we did this, it made it so that in situations, if the path was going straight ahead and the animation was going straight ahead, then both the predicted gold values and the animation clip values would be exactly the same. And that animation would score kind of a perfect score, at least for that metric. Uh, another way that we improved accuracy was extrapolating the samples. We had a lot of using the stand to run as an example again. Um, the, run, the stand to run animation would end after the after the character had gotten up to speed, but it wasn't a looping animation. It wouldn't continue. It was relatively short. Um, but our path samples wanted to continue on at a sampling a much further distance than it took for our character to get up to speed. And so what we would do is we would go and say, okay, as we're going in calculating the uh, the metric data for our animations, look at the speed of the character on the last frame. And if that speed is not zero, then let's assume that they continue forward at that speed for a certain, you know, indefinitely. And so we created kind of fake samples in these cases that would allow things like the stand to runs to get good scores when, uh, when it was going through the motion matching search. Um, another case we ran into was the path would, could be over uneven terrain. So if we were going and calculating the future positions along the path and they were vertically offset, um, then that would yield poor results for our data set, which was exclusively for flat ground movement. So we always had to make sure that we flattened the path before we were going and calculating what our goal metrics were. Uh, and also, very important was correction. So um, we wanted to have a sparse data set. We couldn't ha possibly have enough animation data to cover every possible situation that our motion matching system would be looking for. So invariably, it would pick the closest one, and we would have to go and apply some adjustments to it to go and get it to perfectly follow the path. Well, what happened was if we did not go and apply those corrections to the current clip, then it would score artificially low and you'd be constantly switching out of your current selection, even though the original clip with corrections would yield the correct uh, movement along the path. Um, so that was really important to include um, and, uh, and it fixed a lot of uh, hiccups we were having. Um, in the end, we were really happy with how these three systems kind of came together to give a cohesive performance. The stride retargeting system filled in the gaps in the motion matching set and eliminated foot sliding for us almost completely. Footstep prediction fed into predicting the future footstep and it also helped feed into calculating the goal positions for the motion matching. And motion matching would go and pick animation clips that would help out the stride retargeting so that the difference between the two wasn't very great. Thanks again for listening to this talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, there'll be a live Q&A during the SIGGRAPH conference itself. Uh, bring your questions. I, uh, I look forward to furthering the conversation. Thank you.